FFRDC for, for a while. Uh, and then about 85, I think, uh, we, we got rid of that and it became a not-for-profit again. Okay. Um, so these are the main service lines. So these are the main areas of where we work. Um, I'm embedded within the advanced analytics line. So this is where we've done a lot of simulation modeling, operations research, data science, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, which kind of leads me to some of the case studies of the things we had done, uh, mostly for our NASA client, uh, which, which I'm most familiar with, which is why I'm going to talk about those and uh, how that led to zombies. One of the first projects that I got involved with was looking at uh, air carrier behavior. So it was, uh, you know, we're moving away from radar track, radar tracking of aircraft in the airspace, moving to next gen, which is GPS based. Uh, but a lot of that needs to happen with a coordination between ground investments that the FAA are making for, for transponder, I mean, for receiving transponder signals and then putting avionics in the aircraft itself. But in the aircraft, it can be really, really pricey. Uh, so for these profit maximizing entities, what are these tipping points or thresholds for financial incentives that get them play ball? Uh, in order to do that, we want to look at it from a complexity standpoint. So we created an ecosystem of consumers, willingness to pay curves, heterogeneity, calibrated off the census data, um, and then we proxied uh, airline behaviors in terms of what they would do for, um, based on their business model, whether it was hub and spoke or point to point, like a Southwest airline model, uh, how they might uh, change their schedule offerings, et cetera. Uh, and all that kind of got around to doing the ticket buy sell process with agents, and then the airlines would respond to them, and then they would basically come out with different data uh, but the main thing that they would come out with is the schedule. And based on the schedule, that would feed into other models. And then what we would do with that is, you know, we'd, we'd try to match up with the 10% sample of what actual airline pricing was doing in terms of the frequency of tickets bought and the actual prices. So if we could match the agent behaviors of ticket purchases uh, and matching it to frequency of costs that, that are prices that were paid, Concurrently, we were validating against two specific things. One was the pricing model of the airlines and also uh, what the buying behaviors of the customers were. And then we could feed that into uh, seeding different scenarios and try to find out a decision landscape that the NASA could use to figure out what, what kinds of incentives they could bundle together uh, to move things. Just out of curiosity, was this model run at full scale or some reduced scale, do you remember? It was at uh, one million agents and it was about 56 airlines, I think it was. Because um, so I, I heard the number that like sixty thousand flights a day are up the U.S. Or would you guys run like something? Oh, I see. Scale? Yeah, it was a scale, and it so took a while. We did it from scratch in Java. Wow. So flights were at scale, but it sounds like the customer market was a lot lower. Representative of some sort. That's right. So these are little planes, basically. Yeah, <laughs> but we did try to account for. I mean, there were a lot of simplifying assumptions right, right, that right. we had to make, uh, especially around the business decisions, because it's proprietary. Um, right. But we brought in industry experts, and they chimed in of, of whether this pass and litmus test are you know, acceptable or not. Um, so that was that was an interesting. That was my actually my entry drug into the program here. Um, <coughs> so then we also looked at incorporating GIS. So this one was done in Mason, and it was looking at incorporating data, census tract information, and trying to ping demand signals for what a potential UAS scenario would be like. So if you had a whole bunch of UAS is up in the air and they're all delivering tacos and burritos to your backyard and otherwise delivering your beer um, and there was no air traffic management control. What are plausible scenarios of <laughs> crash incidences and congestion and, and, and measurements of risk that, that might occur? And it was just to kind of move toward the idea of using this as a platform to potentially do that. Um, so those are two examples. So then we started thinking, you know, are there, um, you know, we have a lot of engineers and data scientists and modeling and simulation people who may not know enough about complexity that they want to, you know, pursue coming to a degree program itself to learn more about it. So are there ways to sort of indoctrinate them by coming up with engaging methods or engaging models that they might deal with? And one, uh, you know, that was geared towards trying to organically build ABM and complexity capacity within the company. Uh, but two is, as they talk to clients or as they become more aware of, of what this is all about, try to organically also identify opportunities for where we could you know, potentially apply this. So this is a use case uh, briefing. So there's really not a lot of technical details, a practical description of, of what we did. Um, and it's about around uh, developing a modeling and simulation competition 
That mm. was based on a really fun topic of zombies. Um, and how it's sort of evolved over many years, because uh, we've been running this thing since 2015. And the idea is to provide pre-programmed models uh, of, of these zombie interactions to reduce the barrier of entry. And then to provide you know, free-form areas where you could adjust behavior code for the humans and then have them learn from code and the inline comments and the hints that you can put in there so that you can learn what the code's doing in the net logo environment that they've never been used to before. And then they now they just change the NLS files for human behavior and then try to adjust it from there. And the idea was to also extend the idea to contemporary challenges and to uh, see if you know, beyond the zombie thing, can we also expand it out to other models that are similar. So to the humble beginnings of this, this competition, um, you know, based on uh, Rob's scale, this is about level zero validation right now. It's about caricatures of, do humans run away from zombies? And if zombies come up with, to them, do they bite their head off? And uh, it's true. So uh, you know, this was just sort of the, the general explanation. And this was the beginning of it because it was meant as an introduction to NetLogo, an introduction to the code, and I was just trying to get people involved with what NetLogo was about. But it was coding everything from scratch, and we were kind of holding their hand the entire way. So um, there was some kind of appetite for that, but if you weren't ready for the programming, it kind of got tedious, and uh, some people had interest before we got to the really good stuff. So then I decided to turn it into full-blown competition where we could actually try something different. So here's, a, here's the idea. So we had to come up with a catchy name, a lot of the catchy names, because zombies are so embedded within our culture, uh, we're all gone. Uh, but the idea was a contingency plan, and uh, off of World War Z, con just contingency Z, so that was just sort of the, how that came together. Uh, but it was developed for exposure to the idea of complexity, modeling, to ideas of what simulation modeling is about, random seeds, replications, uh, why, why uh, a computational experiment would actually make sense of the kinds of things that it would do. <clears throat> and then, so following also the context of what the ODD protocol is about, it was trying to talk about things of leveraging your environment through sensing and adaptation, about uh, safe room orienteering, because maybe if there's a conference room, they can barricade the door. So this is about setting up agent objectives and how they would move. Uh, interaction and communication with other humans and zombies, or vice versa, within your quote-unquote species. Um, it's about interaction and sensing and emergence of like the kind of cooperation uh, patterns that might occur because of those interactions. Uh, and then being responsive to change, so being, sense, being able to sense of what other agents are doing or what the environment or ch environmental changes are happening and then being able to adapt to that. Um, and then from an execution standpoint, um, provide a, a more practical example of conceptual understanding of things like uh, how do you abstract the idea of cooperation? And uh, you know, yelling down the hall, hey, come over with me, and then seeing the emergent pattern of everybody sort of creating caravan to, to band together. How do you abstract those ideas? Or how do you also abstract ideas of policy, policy measurements and, and ideas of using a computational environment to, to measure trade-offs um, uh, for policies that don't exist yet? So uh, those are also part of the idea of the competition. <coughs> Um, so feel free to also jump in if you have any questions. Um, but just moving along. Um, so now I'm going to describe to you what the model looked like, just sort of the general rules, and then I can show you what some of these things look like. Do you want to say another word to Brandon about, about, about the actual competition? So this was this was like with uh, with like some potential client users <coughs> with, with with student students, or who, who was the audience for that? Yeah. So uh, this was also meant to try to leverage people who had a lot of extra bandwidth to do it. Uh, and this was um, with the co-ops okay. that we would come in. So we'd have three rotations come in through LMI every year. And uh, part of the growth experience was to give them snapshots of the other things that the company did so that when they left, they would have a more rewarding experience. So it started off with us talking about you know, just complexity and modeling and simulation in general. Uh, and then this became something that would tack on to it, and then they would always compete. Uh, so each class would you know, be able to do this. and then. Uh, part of the evolution of this competition is that we would have recurring three semesters for the most part. So when the new batch would, or batch would return, we couldn't use the same model. So mm -hmm. that kept us on our toes where we had to keep modifying and keep adjusting as well. And it was kind of thing where they, were there, are they locked in a room writing code for a day, or is this like over the course of a week or two? They, they, write, they, they had about three weeks. Okay. Uh, we started off with a month, 
and then we realized that they didn't start it until the weekend before. Mm. Uh, so then we just started started tricking the time, uh, and then like three weeks was about a good compromise because we went down to two, and then people complained. Anyway, um, and team teams of poker. Teams of we had optional teams. Uh, some people wanted to go alone, okay. um, but we did have options of teams, and it, it, it did work out pretty well too. And the other thing to note is that as we go through and we talk about the successes and the accomplishments of the program. What's really impressive is that all of these, these students coming out of for the co-op program, they were in an engineering program or a computer science field or something technical, but a lot of them had little to zero programming experience and little to zero, most of them zero for modeling and simulation experience. So um, the kinds of results that we got were pretty awesome, uh, given that sort of background. Um, okay, so uh, this was about contagion. So um, you know, the model is about the diffusion of the zombie virus through the population. Uh, it explores questions about survivability, uh, and, and the, the way you contract it is when you have an interaction between a human and a zombie. Um, so we had two main agents to do that. You have humans and then zombies. Uh, and there's two basic general processes in the model that were carried over through all the variants that we developed. Um, the first one was about species-specific movement for both humans and zombies. So the idea was that humans would be a little bit more fluid and zombies had you know, characteristic like ambling gait, so they would be a little bit slower. Um, and the encounter dynamics uh, was about who would survive the encounter and then whether or not uh, the human became infected. So, uh, and we'll go into some of those details, but there was always a probability that uh, you could escape under a table or use a chair and <laughs> defend yourself or something. Uh, but the idea was if the zombie ever won, uh, with like 75% probability, uh, you would 100% of the time turn into a zombie. And then contagion, and then it would spread. <clears throat> um, and then depending on the competition version, there were additional sub-models that we tried to look at. So things like uh, some kind of sustainability parameter where the zombies, if they didn't eat brains every so often, they would start to lose energy and then they would die a second time. Uh, or uh, you would have safe room dynamics about running into an area, closing the door and barricading it, and then having zombies indirectly cooperate to push and overcome the barricade and then breach in. Um, and then furniture interactions, so we can show you some of that one. So we had to uh, keep things interesting, uh, which, by the way, really helps improve your net logo skills if you ever want to keep trying to do something like that. Um, so in terms of concepts, you know, going back to the ideas of what ODD specifies, uh, the basic principle was to uh, have this model address the idea of contagion of the zombie virus through a population. Uh, humans would uh, adaptive behaviors by running at a faster speed if they sensed something was chasing them, uh, coming within sort of a, a bound of, of what their sensing range was. Uh, zombies would also exhibit adaptive behavior because they would have a straight line sort of uh, smelling capability. If they smelled a human nearby, they would start making a beeline. So they would adapt their behaviors based on what they've sensed from the environment. And then observe observations for the overall outcomes based on looking at measures of the overall population as we would go. So the reason I put concepts on this side translates over to the idea of implementation on sub-models on the other side. Uh, so basically for the movement in a, in a net logo sort of way, uh, we looked at it for every time step, both humans and zombies uh, would move to the, most, to the nearest unoccupied space. And this sort of like the, the stop behind. And um, this is what people would try to adjust for, for their strategies. Um, and if a zombie smelled within some parameter for smell radius, uh, the zombie would increase their speed and then chase the nearest human. Um, the nearest human being uh, something that we'd always harp in on as a, as a hint, and then they would try to use some information like that. Um, and then uh, if the human senses a zombie, they would... Um, adjust their heading, and that was one of the main things that people would have to adjust. Because right now the stock behavior was turn one 180 degrees and then run, but then they would run into a wall or run into another zombie, and it's like trying to throw somebody out between second and third base, mm -hmm. and then it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you're out. Um, right, so we talked about the zombie encounter, the probability for actually uh, winning the, in an encounter with a zombie was something like 25% on stock, um, and that, that was locked down. Did you Consider changes in activation? No. You gotta repeat the question. Oh, sorry. The question was, did we consider changes in activation? Uh, we didn't get 
to that point. So you used what NetLogo provides, which was random address. That's right. Yeah. But we did lock down seats to try to increase uh, the participability. Um, so for other considerations, um, other core submodels that would sort of pop up as the competition would evolve is this idea of safe rooms. So, um, you know, if you had like a meeting room or a conference room on the map, uh, because this was done in the LMI virtual office, uh, humans would find a random safe room. Uh, not all the rooms are safe. Every uh, instantiation of the model would have a different setup of safe rooms. Uh, you would be able to block it. Um, but there were some caveats that would sort of change with the different variants. Like if you stopped right inside the doorway and then some of your pixel was like slightly overlapping, the zombie coming by the door could still pull you out and then still eat you. So it would, you would have to think about finding the doorway based on patch colors or patch sensing and then in further if you want to still stay safe. Um, but as we see in one of the creative solutions, uh, that was actually used to their advantage. Um, yeah. Uh, online comment from Brent Audible uh -huh. says, we also allow the competitors to come to our experience modelers for advice. Yes. So Brent Audible, uh, former LMI employee, uh, was key in helping with uh, the startup of this, as was Chris Johnson, uh, who I also want to call out because he did a lot of the, the base code work uh, for the model. And then we sort of built on to that and it just kept, kept going. So thanks, Brent. Um, Right, and then uh, the idea was if you could get to a room as fast as you could and get as many people in there, you could actually really barricade the door. So if you had less than five people and zombies started accumulating by the door and they exceeded the five limit, they could actually breach the door and overpower the, the people. They would go in, the room would lose its safe status and it would never be safe again and you would be fish in the barrel. Uh, if you had more than five people in the room, you would actually be able to hold off any breach indefinitely. So the idea was to see how many you could get in at the same time as quickly as possible to really protect that, that room. Um, and the emergent dynamics was that a uh, potential project that you would strategize and encode was really meant to try to facilitate ideas of human cooperation and embedded within the model with zombies hearing other zombies but not communicating per se and then grumbling about because they're trying to get into a door but they can't get into the safe room, they would indirectly cooperate because then they would congregate. If they exceeded the threshold, then they would bust down the door. So what that led to in terms of emergent dynamics is you actually had you're pitting human cooperation versus zombie cooperation, albeit indirectly. Um, the, you know, zombies couldn't walk through walls, they can't pass through obstacles, they can't <clears throat> smell through walls. So this comes in key with some of the winning strategies, uh, they, uh, if they enter, yeah, so uh, rules about how they would enter a safe room if they could or not. Um, they couldn't use any other means for human protection other than that smell room. Um, there was always a population of 15 that would be randomly scattered throughout the map. Sometimes at the beginning they were in one location, but then we scattered them. Um, right. Uh, humans, they, they can't use weapons. So the idea here also was that we wanted it all to be about human evasion behaviors. We didn't want people to get weapons and start running through LMI. We wanted, we wanted you to run away. Uh, so it was all about evasion. Um, right, so that was, that, was, that was the main thing there. Um, they had limited zombie detection, uh, but LMIers could communicate to other LMIers within the building. Okay, so this goes back to some of the execution the, in terms of how we allow them to modify code. And hopefully this is just providing background of how we just technically executed it before we get into some of the more interesting animations. Um, but the idea was if we locked down the main code and then we created an extension file .nls and then that was the embodiment of all the human logic, then all they needed to do was learn from the core code, adjust only the nls file, and then they would just submit the nls to us. And then we would load that in, kind of see how that went. Um, and we would control the random seeds uh, over, uh, we had 10 different seeds. So it wasn't fully robust, but we just had 10 seeds that they didn't know about. They could adjust their, their random seed if they wanted to see if they could you know, come up with more robust solutions. But we controlled the random seed for where the initial placements were going to be. 
and then that was going to be the competitive scenario that everybody would be benchmarked against in an equal way. And then at the end of 1006, see what the surviving populations were, map that out using R, and then we would find out who had the highest median survival rate after the 1006. And that was a winning team. And if we ever had a tie, which we did for some strange reason, down to like uh, two significant digits, uh, then we use the variance of the, of the blocks plot as a, as a tiebreaker. See who was most consistent. And then here was a general flow. So we got the floor plan. I digitized it and cleaned it up in GIMP uh, because the, the, the architectural plan, the floor plan had a one line. When we digitized it, it was so thin that uh, the wall didn't mean anything. So I actually had to use the editing software to make it thick. And then I used the R script to convert it to an asset file, which would allow it then to be sucked in through the GIS library and the logo. Uh, then you would develop the model on top of that. And then behavior space was used to lock down uh, the, the model runs, the competition runs, with the set 10 seats. So that way we could distribute the running of the code across a lot of evaluators, pool the results, and then, and then adjudicate the winner. How long does it take to run one run? Depends on uh, the kinds of code code that the participants would add. In general, it'd probably be about you know less than 15, 20 minutes. We had one person that tried to do A star and, and uh, pathfinding, uh, and it ended up taking about 45 to an hour for one run, and then uh, you were disqualified. <laughs> we just couldn't handle it. Uh, but he went all out. Um, uh, so that was Alec Morris, and he, he's a grad student at the digital engineering program here, and he was also key because he was so engaged with it that he was able to come on and help run the competition as well. Um, and the other person is that I want to call Nate Aerosmith, uh, who, who was a former LMI employee, but he really helped sort of carry the torch with this thing as well, too. And you'll see his winning, his winning software. So this is what it looks like. This was the uh, version one. You have uh, green zombies uh, with a label that says Gur, and they're running around. The blue are the uh, safe rooms. This is the first version, so even though they're pulling up over here, for example, they can't break through the door. That logic is in, in the model yet. Um, but the stock logic, you would have people run in, and then if they go through the door, since it's random movement, they would run back out and they would die. And so it was all kinds of things that, uh, that was available for people to try to adjust. And then, you know, as we started getting more involved, we had to do different things. So <laughs> this is where we started activating now the base and the stairwells uh, so that if you hit one of these dark blue patches, you would be able to track to the next floor or go back down to the other floors. Um, you can see the scale's a lot bigger, so it's moving a lot slower. You can the model. Um, uh, in, this, in this case, the... Uh, the humans can barricade themselves and zombies can uh, take over the safe rooms. And these uh, dark blue objects, those are office chairs, and those became a third agent. Uh, and as the humans would run by, they were also allowed to where they could take the chair and carry it with them and move. And then if they were being chased, they would have the option of doing things behind them to slow a zombie's pursuit uh, or do other things like that. Uh, Nobody ever took full advantage of that, uh, but that was something interesting that uh, Nate Aerosmith had plugged in that uh, I thought was really great. Um, it started getting pretty crazy. And then start, when you start getting crazy like this, to make it even more fun, I mean, you have to do a bracket, right? So, uh, move here. That's what the bracket look like. Uh, and then we had bracket competitions where we ended up having the teams compete. Not only would they compete now with their human logic, but we flipped it. And for every matchup, you were also doing zombie now. So your zombie code would go against your competitor's human code, and then vice versa. You could see if you could hunt and then survive uh, in different ways. Uh, so this one was much longer. So this one was longer than the three weeks. I think this was a four week one. Um, and then these numbers here in the parentheses were the, the mean, median survival rates for the But uh, yeah, that was that was that was fun. <clears throat> so this was all still done at LMI, and then 
to get even crazier, we decided, what happens if we stare? I didn't have the energy to do this to George Mason. So uh, Nate Aerosmith really was the champion of this. He, he was out And when we went, he went big. Uh, so we got involved with Informs and IIE. Uh, we had uh, the contest sanctioned. LMI uh, sponsored the competition. We had their head of engineering get zombified in digital art form on posters and the giant stand, stand up cut out. Uh, the, the event was promoted through uh, job fairs, the career fair and the LMI booth there. Uh, we submitted an ORMS Today article. So Informs is the largest um, organization, professional organization for ORSAs. And um, we were able to get an article submitted to them. Uh, and then once the competition kicked off, Nate would uh, also leverage the RIT management software for course management to actually have like a home for people to engage with the competition, submit questions. He held office hours uh, to answer NetLogo questions. Um, so it was the full gamut to try to find out like what it would take to, to go big, and it was a lot. <laughs> um, but we ended up getting the cover article on <laughs> Informs. Um, so the name of the presentation got pulled off of that, but it was, it was really interesting to, to get on that. And we were able to talk about the things that we were doing at OMI and then for the competition. Now, RIT, this was also a different change because we could see how that scalable process would work. So we took the floor plan of their engineering building, did the same digitization framework, scaled it up because it was a lot bigger than what the LMI floor plan was, and we kind of saw how that worked out. There's a lot of details and assumptions you have to make, like the auditorium here. We tried to keep the chairs too much, so it just became a giant warehouse room. Um, but uh, because of the different setup, a lot of the strategies that worked well on the LMI side didn't really work well here because it was a lot more open space. Um, so some of the winning strategies here that, that really worked well was to kind of sense where the hallway corners were, and you put in some trigonometry into the movement, and then you would have smooth smooth turning, uh, so the, the evasion, the running away was actually way more efficient, uh, and he was able to get away from the zombies a lot quicker. And that was this guy here showing his, his methods. We had uh, 50 people sign up. Uh, only 25 people ended up competing because uh, they, they ended up going out, but um, with teams of three, it ended up with high 10, 10 uh, submissions uh, with different models. Um, and it was a really diverse Base. It was uh, grad students, it was undergrad students across uh, IT and computer science, applied math, and then there were some cash prizes that uh, LMI sponsored for that. So in terms of some of the creative results, um, I won't go into a lot of these, um, just so we didn't have an archive of all the solutions in case we want to run this again, <laughs> but uh, some of the best ones, uh, these blew me away. And remember, these people? had very little programming experience and almost no modeling and simulation experience. So they're all undergrads, right? For these, yes. For these examples, yes, they're all undergrads. So um, this guy, Sean Monahan, Georgia Tech, he was a winner in 2015. I like this quote uh, for because everybody had like one or two slides in it, and he called his agents uh, frightened little chickens, um, always trying to find a place to hide and then freeze. And remember <laughs> Zombies uh, in this model construct can only find people that have a straight line scent range, right? So if you have a wall between, that line hits and then that scent line is broken. So what he did was try to minimize the exposure. So what you see here with these green lines is if they detected that they were in a patch that represented a corner, they stopped because they know that zombies can only smell them in this, in this, this space in front of them and their backs are protected. And then if the agent comes, then they're like, okay, okay, now I got to go. And then they would run. Um, then for people uh, who found the safe room, he would actually have them also stay close by the door. Not too close, but close by, which would allow an angle of scent for the zombies who were coming by. He created what he called zombie traps because the zombies would be attracted and it would take those zombies out of the play. They're trying to get to an agent, while the other agents have more time now to find places to hide or to get to a safe room. So they're taking one for the team. <laughs> um, right. I thought that was genius. It was so simple, uh, mm -hmm. right? But that was the idea of what so we're trying to trap the zombies? Because it's, uh, it's attracting their attention. So this zombie right here, mm -hmm. 
He's wasting his time trying to get to this agent. Because he can smell this agent, but he can't get through the door. He can't get through the door. Right. And now it's taken this zombie out from chasing the other one. So he can't get, but he's in trouble if the zombies trouble. He traps too many zombies. Exactly. Does he let humans in if they show up? Yeah. Humans would have to get through the zombies. So given the default behavior, humans would probably never do that because they would sense the zombies. They would really do that. But it was, it was great. You know, Brendan, he actually does. Uh, these were good strategies, or did he end up kind of like inadvertently stumbling on them? I think he intuited it. Okay. Yeah. I think. These are these are really bad guys. Um, but yeah, I think there were other times where people just kind of ran into things and, and, and did that. Well, that's true. If everybody creates a zombie trap, then the zombies are not going to collect a butt. The only way of getting five zombies is very small because they're all each individual. They're all busy. <laughs> right. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, human agent agent communication was another one. This one uh, from Nate, you know, there you'll see them start turning colors because when one finds a safe room, it sort of broadcasting flickers so that he's using that. So we taught uh, visualization as a debugging. And then as that would happen, that would just daisy chain down to all the other agents say, "Oh, I see somebody that's saying I found something." And that person next to them says, oh, I see something, I see somebody, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. And then pretty soon then you get to where people then all follow each other to get to the safe room. Uh, and then in the case here, uh, it's the same sort of thing where uh, if they see a safe room, they turn black. And then, and then if other agents see somebody who, who turned that color, then they would also know, hey, looks like they're running, better follow them. And then, and then uh, they were able to clear the map pretty quickly. So these were probably the most effective solutions. Um, I don't think there was a lot of co-op talk over the years, uh, but they, they, were, they were pretty effective. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, when we talk about creative explorations, especially for people who didn't know anything about NetLogo or complexity or what agent-based models are, some of the coolest things were people who came up to me and started saying that they looked at the model library. And they, they had a general sense that they wanted agents, humans, to bond together and travel together. So they tried to lift code from the flocking example, <laughs> which is awesome, right? Yeah. So they tried to leverage the flocking idea, the flocking code, reuse that in their own models. It didn't end up working, but that was a great idea to, to start from, especially when you have no idea what these things are. Um, the smoothing one I talked about, uh, the shortest path, this was the one that took really long time, but giving kudos for trying, right? Um, to try to figure out, you know, scattered nodes across the entire landscape and figure out the best paths uh, based on, on what the nodes are looking like or other neighbors are saying. So then uh, there were two examples as we started getting tired of zombies and people kept returning. So we wanted to look at some other real world use cases. So one of the things we did, we tried to keep the Z theme and then Zika uh, was an idea Nate came up with, Nate Aerosmith. Uh, so we turned it to contingency Zika. And uh, the idea here of what we want to talk about was, how can you take something with like Atari 2600 graphics <laughs> and abstract an idea like policy development, right? Um, especially for looking at things like spraying, uh, spraying chemicals that might impact citizens or affecting breeding areas uh, you know, for mosquito growth, um, closing down you know, different facilities or whatever it is, um, how do you abstract those ideas in an easy, tractable way? So that, that was the genesis of this one. So here we had different kinds of agents for humans, for mosquitoes, uh, for civic workers that would then go and clear up puddles, uh, breeding areas, um, and they would scatter across the map. So you had these different puddles that you could eliminate, uh, breeding grounds, you had uh, static water bodies that you could then spray around, uh, but every time you spray, it would affect the, the objective function that was uh, just some hypothesized um, uh, combination of how all these factors would play together for a policy, an aggregate policy score. And then they could see as they make different decisions, that the trade-offs would affect the score, and you could use that as just an abstract idea of what 
DOS would mean, whether it would go up or down based on the kinds of inter interventions that you would do. Um, and then uh, fisheries management, Rob, uh, but this was using um, GIS for, from the Coast Guard. Uh, this one was interesting because now we started getting into territory where uh, the Coast Guard themselves actually came to LMI. They would talk about real world use cases of the kinds of things that they did, and one of the things they briefed on was fisheries management and um, the idea of trying to play around in a virtual way what interdiction strategies for their cutters might be like uh, to catch um, illegal fishing, you know, red handed. So we uh, modeled pink areas as protected waters and uh, other areas as, um, uh, you know, legal waters to fish in. And then we had just rough abstract assumptions for as you would fish it what the regrowth rate might be like so you would overfish those areas and and then that would trigger a sort of uh, going bad turning bad uh, uh, parameters within the fisher fishing vessels to see if they wanted to take a risk and then go into the pink area and then the interdiction strategies would be where should I place myself uh, to sort of patrol and what frequencies and what areas and what spread to try to mitigate that and then again, this is about abstract <coughs> policy trade-off measurement, but just having some kind of great illegal total catch. And, um, and then we looked at over the course of the years, uh, you know, different different in the U.S., but always using the actual GIS imagery, uh, and then cleaning that up, and then plugging that in. So Alec Morris kind of did a lot of this one. With possible apologies to the military, or the, or the Coast Guard, basically the zombies here, that chasing them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, uh, so this is just a quick timeline of this evolution of the competition, right? So we have a little baby zombie here at uh, level zero. Uh, and then you have this giant block of what contingency Z was all about, uh, where on the top it's about features in the competition in terms of how we decide to add variety of execution. And, um, it's about like human behaviors and competition ready, zombie hordes, office context, the idea of safe rooms, really fleshing out the idea of uh, cooperation and then moving into multiple floors and interactive environments, uh, spicing things up with terms and human evasion and zombie hunting behaviors. And then going into like the, the real world use cases where we might extend that those ideas of what these competitions might look like, all uh, all revolving around the idea of uh, virtual plausible things that you can play with. So what's the next chapter? Uh, yeah, what's the next chapter? Um, yeah, I'm I'm sort of new in my role, so right now my, my job is to survive, <laughs> uh, and then we'll we'll go from there. Um, but one of the things that uh, when I talked about like sort of evolution and inspiration, remember that these have never done a lot of programming or net logo before. And this is the kind of thing that they start got inspired to do. So one of our winners at RIT, he built a, a soccer game in net logo. It was even to the point where as a soccer ball would move through the different physics of it actually getting kicked, he would randomize the ball. So visually, it would actually look like the ball was rolling. Uh, so it was just sort of down to that nuance where he, he, like that's how much Domingo got into it. Uh, so he now works at Tesla. Um, but uh, yeah, and then it, it's accumulative, right? So after each goal or after each play, he's checking and he's aggregating time. There is a you know, soccer competition every year. Yeah. Yeah. Is that RoboCup? Yeah. yeah. And then Nate uh, decided to go for Top Gun, so he's, he's, he's matching up U.S. fighters against Soviet fighters. And he, the same flair, he's got contrast coming off the back of the, uh, the, uh, the jet fighters that have a gradient to it, so it's darker right off the engine and it starts lightening up. And the, the, he also included, I, I forget what it was when you voted about the model. At the end? Yeah, it's at the end. Yeah. <coughs> Um, so right now the, the dark fighters are U.S., the red fighters are Soviet, and then that's the last fighter up there. That's, uh, and Tom Cruise. Nick 28. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Taurus, though. Uh, are they something? Yes, so they have two weapon choices that you can adjust the parameters for. It's uh, your, your, your cannon and your rockets. And they all have physics associated with them and how they're turned. And 
move based on on the bearing and the uh, of the jets. Do they, you know, shoot another agent that is chained in the machine? That's how they did it. Uh, you know, I didn't study the code. I'm just, I was just super happy that they got into it that much that they decided on their own. They just started building out these these types of things. But it all sort of, it got started from zombies. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you can't have a Stanley Cup without the Stanley Cup, right? <laughs> so uh, we took a bobblehead that we normally use for our LMI IQ competition. We zombified it. And then one of our vice presidents loved it so much that he actually ordered a, a legit trophy base that we engraved the winners on. And then on the side, you see like contingency Z, contingency Zika, contingency fisheries. Um, maybe the next one's about cyber uh, with a Z in cyber. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, that's that's all I've got. Very good. Good. Any questions? So can you tell us a little bit about you have an analytics component um, uh, at LMI? Is that new, or has there always been a separate analytics component? Sure. So the question was about uh, analytics capability at LMI. Uh, that's always been there. Um, we do have it much more consolidated now in terms of um, really doubling down on the ideas of uh, you know, where technology is going now. So it's about data engineering, data biz, data, um, data product development, and data science, and how those integrate with uh, existing methods that have a lot of expertise in, which is modeling, simulation, and operations research. And what portion of that would be complexity or complexity? Very little right now. Yeah. Well, you I'm figure that's driven that. by the fact that, that the customers are not. They don't know how to articulate yeah. that they want it. Uh, I think everybody is interested in second order, third order effects. But uh, because they don't know how to articulate it well, I think at this point, um, the idea of being receptive to a complexity perspective is, is limited. How many co ops are still working with uh, A bunch, actually. Um, not all of them, but I'd say probably about at least a quarter. Any other questions? Let me mention one thing that um, those of you who are longtime attendees at this at this uh, seminar will remember that uh, three or four years ago we had uh, Alexander from the math department came, and she gave her differential equations model of zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we've had the agent model and the, and, the, and, the, and the OD one both, and they do somewhat different things, obviously, and, uh, but they're both you know, valid approaches to science. Uh, I'll, I'll, I mean, the last point to make, though, is that if somebody can Google Scholar real fast, there's a, there's a paper from like 1998 by Rick Riolo and, uh, and a couple other people at Michigan. Are, it's, it's, I should say the late Rick Riolo, who just passed away recently, I'm sorry to say that. Of the first MABS meetings. And their paper, I think, is very widely cited. It's over a thousand citations, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that paper was a was a compare and contrast on uh, a different approach to supply chain versus an ABM approach. So I think that there's my sense is that there's different appetite in the research community comparing and contrasting differential equations versus agents. We now, you've now seen uh, the Asian version here, and, we, and you can, we, can, we can darken Professor Sanders' doorstep for an, an ABM ver for an, for an ODE version. I just assert that uh, if anybody who's look, looking for a master's degree thesis topic, or maybe for a mm -hmm. chapter of your dissertation to do a uh, comparison. comparison between uh, mathematical and analytical modeling approaches for versus a computationally uh, Rich one like we've seen today, uh, there may be a chance to do something. Agent based modeling versus modeling a case study and user's guide. And how many citations? I bet over a thousand. Uh, 783. Very good, excellent. So it's a, a, I think, a good potential for this. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's, I kind of stumbled off. Um, yeah, for my dissertation, but actually through uh, uh, like biology, they're doing these multi-scale models. Cellular, it's agent based, and then what I think what it puts into the rest of the cell uh, environment, the PDEs and PDE systems cells, systems. yeah, uh, and so that, that's a it's like high, these hybrid uh, hybrid multi scale models, what they call, the where they merge them together.
Very good. So also, if there are no more questions, we'll thank Grant again. And